Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Skip Meetings podcast. I am delighted to be joined today by Barbara Scafidio and Andrea Doyle, my colleagues here at Skip Meetings. And my name is Miguel Neves. Welcome, everybody. Hey there, it's Seth Borko, the head of Skip Research, and I've got a brand new report that I want to share with you today. It's called our State of Travel 2024 report. It's perhaps the single most comprehensive report we do every year. And the best part, it's free to download right now. We have 350 plus insights in this report with pretty much a chart for basically any sector. Do you need a chart on hotels? We've got that. A chart on airlines? We've got it. A chart on consumer behavior? Guess what? We've got that too. I really appreciate if you check out our State of Travel report. You can download it now by going to skiff.com slash state of travel with dashes between every word. So that's skip.com slash state dash of dash travel. Download the report, check it out, and let me know what you think. I hope you enjoy. Before we get started, just a little housekeeping. I want to remind you quickly to follow or subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening or watching. If you're enjoying the show, please rate us five stars or leave a positive review so we can spread the word about the Skiff Meetings podcast. This really helps us get the word out. And if you have a moment, why not share this with a colleague or friend? So um, we are here to talk about this one show that you may have heard of. We've talked about it a million times before. It's called IMAX, and all three of us were there last week feels like a century ago um but we were all there until last week uh, we're recording this on friday the 18th so it's just been just been over a week since the show ended and we were one of 15 and a half thousand people that went through those doors that were at imax last week big numbers biggest show on record uh we've covered this on skiff meetings there were five and a half thousand buyers that were involved in eighty six thousand meetings over three days so I think um, just to start off, I wanted to get your impressions, Barbara, Andrea, just like what you like. These numbers may sound big and they're easy to sort of just talk about. But what did this feel like when you were there? Did you, was there a buzz? Was it busy? Like, can you give us just like your first person impression of what was it like as a member of the media, which, of course, you know, we're not buyers or sellers. So our experience is a little bit different. But our, as a member of the media, what did it feel like? And I'll, and I'll start with Andrea. So it's a reunion of sorts. So these are people we talk to all year long. We interview for stories. Um, they take part in our global forum. And to be with everyone, I mean, like you said, 15,000 people on the show floor in Mandalay Bay. It's such a celebration of the industry, but it's also a place to uh, network, to get story ideas, to learn about what's new in the industry. There were so many research reports that were released like this is the week for the industry. Yeah. Barbara? Yeah, I would add that it felt like the industry is in full swing, doing well. There were a lot of investments in pretty showy booths um, uh, and it, it, incredible activations, you know, pick a ball court in the middle of the of the show, that kind of thing. So uh, it's it was a, a very healthy IMAX. Yeah, for sure. And something you mentioned, Andre, I think like to kind of pick up on it's, you know, it, it, that that idea that loads of research and loads of things were launched at the show. I think more more than ever, I felt like people were really waiting for the show um, to launch things like there was there was actual, you know, some pretty interesting news, definitely some interesting reports from Freeman from the IRF and a number of other ones kind of launched things. And you know, I think there's this narrative that trade shows have become less the place to launch things. And I'm talking more about, you know, electronics or cars or something like that. But it feels like at IMAX, the trend might be going in the other direction. It feels like the place where things kind of, you know, people wait for IMAX to launch something. And I think that's, I think, quite healthy for the show, I would say. Absolutely, because it makes it a not to miss event. Yeah. All right. So we, we're also kind of, you know, we're there and Vegas was busy, right? We were um, 15 and a half thousand people. That sounds like a lot, but there were much larger shows or larger shows, let's say, going on around us. So this was by no means the only uh, the only thing going on in Vegas that week. I mean, Vegas has a capacity, I think, hun over 150,000 hotel rooms. So it's used to many events, many large events going on. But 
I think we all experienced that it was quite tricky to get around Vegas, right? Like the the the, the traffic, the congestion, particularly those peak times, like getting to the show at 9 a.m. or something like that was not an easy task, and particularly because people were staying all over the Strip and really all over the city. Um, just want to get your impressions of that as well. I think we've all been to Vegas a number of times, and I think probably people listening have been as well, but it was not the easiest to navigate, I'd say, from a, from our perspective. And then added to the other shows in town, there was the convenience store show also in Mandalay Bay. They had all of upstairs. So that convention center was packed. If you wanted to try to get a dinner reservation or a lunch reservation the day of, it was impossible. But then also all the construction going on for F1. Yeah, F1 is is disruptive (laughs) when it comes to uh, transportation. There's no question. So, uh, you know, a ride that would usually take 15 minutes, you really had to give yourself a half hour. You had to figure it would take twice as long. I can't get over the stands they put up in front of the Bellagio fountains, all the lighting, um, all the bleachers. I mean, all over the strip, all you see are rows and rows of bleachers. And that made transportation tougher. But I have to give Caesars a shout out because we were staying at the Paris. They had a really great shuttle system back and forth to the convention center that everyone took advantage of. So then it was awesome because I met so many great people on that shuttle. So like networking started before you even got to the convention center. I would also add that the um, proliferation of Ubers um, made it really tricky at the convention center to, to, to find your Uber to, there were just, there were just huge crowds of people waiting for Ubers with no real organization. So that's a, that's a little different than, than what I recall. Yeah. The scale is tricky to manage. I, I think the buses are actually IMAX buses, if I'm not mistaken, but they, they have, you know, hosted oh, by our kind of focus buses right. going to yeah, right, many yeah. other different hotels, but yeah. Always good to find. And, and I think one thing we also noticed is some of the hotels in uh, in Vegas, I think Paris was one of them, has moved the place where you pick up an Uber, right? Like the Uber pickup place. And that, for whatever reason, it, it does, I think mo- in most cases, it's moved kind of further away, right? So it does make it a little bit trickier for, for people to move around uh, kind of swiftly. So definitely something to consider. And of course, on the well, Wednesday, very early morning, I think it was 2.30 in the morning on Wednesday, we had the <laughs> drop the trop, the implosion of the Tropicana Hotel, farewell to the third oldest hotel in, in Las Vegas, which I think some people were quite sentimental about. But that was an event in itself, right? So only in Vegas, you have this kind of show and you fireworks and drones and all sorts of things. And that just happened to be right in the middle of IMEX. So something else to add to already a kind of a busy week, right? <laughs> and that implosion really was done Vegas style with the fireworks, like you said, in the drone show. And um, what I really loved was there were several groups within the industry that did little get togethers. They rented suites overlooking the implosion so they had their own little networking party as they watched the Tropicana come down. At 2 a.m. Yeah, it's the the pajama party, right? That was kind of like the hottest ticket in town that week, apparently. But uh, you know, I, I was in bed by that point, you know, very, very intentionally. With the nine-hour time difference for where, I'm, for where I'm based, it is tough to kind of do those two o'clock in the morning kind of activities. But I mean, it was history. Now, one thing I wanted to mention, and and I think, you know, there was a press conference at the show from MLB, right? And of course, the Tropicana is, I believe, I don't think it's been fully confirmed yet, but it's making place for a baseball stadium. And the Oakland A's will become the Las Vegas A's. Again, this is not fully confirmed, but that is kind of what, what, where the direction is going. But so implosion of hotel to make way for a baseball stadium. And there were... I believe seven different baseball teams present at booths, at destination booths at um, at IMAX. And of course, the MLB was there as well with an activation on the way in. So this idea of baseball stadiums or ballparks being venues for events is, I feel like there's a lot of investment there. And, and I, I mean, I just wanted to get your take on it. I am not a baseball fan. I have to admit, I, I'm European. So, you know, American sports are kind of a little bit foreign for me, but I do feel like Baseball has a certain nostalgia around it, a certain magic around it. I think the idea of holding events in baseball stadiums does appeal a lot. So, But I think this this kind of joint effort is, is super interesting. You know what I found interesting? These were all competing teams that came together 
to market themselves as event venues. And I've never seen something like this before. This is a new grouping. And um, they even had a press conference just explaining how they're going to go about attracting events. There's so much it can do with a, with a stadium. Uh, there's a, such a wow factor for a group to be at a stadium when it's not in use in the middle of the field with no one there. Uh, they do all kinds of activations that they can do in the locker room or they can run you out just like the team would run out the tunnel. You know, it's, it's, it's very exclusive um, and exciting, whether you're a sports fan or not, to be in that setting. And talking about stadiums, I know a bunch of planners were invited to Allegiant Stadium during IMAX for a special event. And um, I was talking to one of the planners and it was really a VIP experience that when they got there, they were led into the locker room where they had um, personalized jerseys waiting for them. And they had this beautiful, intimate dinner on the 50 yard line. So Allegiant Stadium is really incredible. And it almost seems as if it was built with groups in mind, not just fans, but actual uh, events. And, um, you know, the dining they have available there is such first rate. I've We had an opening reception there for a conference I attended. So that's a stadium that gets it right for group business. I love it. And, and Barbara, I mean, you were mentioning already a little bit about baseball, the magic of the baseball stadium, right? With your planner experience, have you ever organized an event at a ballpark? No, but I have been to um, to an, an event. It was actually at a at a um, a couple. Um, most recently, um, Olympic Stadium in Paris, and we were um, we were taken there to to see all that the all the developments that were going on before the Olympics, and got to be uh, run like I was saying with the group, um, did the, the run through the tunnel and wow. screamed and videotaped ourselves. And it was just, just such fun. And the scale of a stadium when you're, when you're there alone, um, in the middle of it is just phenomenal. It's like you get a different feeling for it than you do when you're in the bleachers. I, yeah. I went to another event once at city field in New York city, go Mets. And um, it was supposed to be on the field, the dinner, but it was a really treacherous evening. So they moved it inside into the concourse. So that's one great thing about these stadiums. They're so versatile. And I think what, you know, the the, the MLB staff and some of the stadium owners, they made a great point. I mean, they're not used that many times a year, right? So they're they're actually empty and uh, and it's a great use of just real estate right like to be able to do that and they have all the facilities etc so i think it's it is it is a, a definitely a win-win so i want to go back a little bit in time because we're talking about activations we're talking about the show itself which i think makes a lot of sense but we also had smart monday which is that day before the show opens which has become very very popular some data from mpi i think they had almost 1600 attendees participate altogether. Uh, that's a 30% increase over last year, and they had 46 sessions compared to 30 sessions last year. So it's definitely a, a significant amount of education and sessions going on. There's keynotes as well. Uh, they had 1,250 people attend those keynotes. But you know, we had our innovation lab on the Monday. Uh, that was an afternoon session, a two-hour session, and we had around 60, 70 people attend. And we kind of try to make it the most useful, most interesting way to start the IMAX experience. And, um, you know, all the feedback that we got was was excellent. I think people really appreciated it. We did a lot of kind of networking exercises, get people to connect and really buddy up for their IMAX experience. Just wanted to get your take as well. I mean, you were, you were there, you were part of the experience. You were kind of communicating, getting people involved and making the most of that, that experience. Um, I mean, anything to uh add? Miguel, you were the moderator and it, you did such an amazing job. And I really loved the way that it was peer to peer focused. So it wasn't really one of us on the stage speaking at length. It was planners learning from planners. And I loved the interaction you injected by having planners who have planned for X amount of years go in one part of the room and more experienced planners in another part of the room. It got people up and moving and everyone I talked to loved it. Yeah, I mean, it was very intentional. I think it was a two hour session. I think out of those two hours, 
we all three of us spoke at some point from the front uh, of the room, you know, from the stage, if you will. But I think if that was 10 minutes out of the two hours, it was probably less than 10 minutes, right? Like most of the event was about people, planners talking to planners, about people connecting, learning from each other and and, and networking. And I think that's that's something that's important, I think, because once you once you step onto the show floor, you have your appointments, you have your mission, but it's it's quite overwhelming. So hopefully it was a positive contrast for everybody involved. And I think it was so helpful because it gave planners a chance to talk about challenges. And then sometimes when you talk about those challenges, you realize you're not alone and you have someone else that you could lean on. And I saw so many people exchanging contact info. So I'm sure people made bonds that are going to last a lifetime. Right. I saw them leaving together and it's, you know, they'll see each other throughout the week. So I think Smart Monday and our event, our, our get together, we're all about uh, really icebreakers and um, getting to know each other, uh, much less formal than the show floor. There were so many activations. I haven't been at Smart Monday in probably 10 years. And uh, the main hallway outside of the meeting rooms was filled with everything from puppy cuddling to, um, you know, make your own head, sh- get, get your own headshot done. Uh, some very fun, just pure fun activations like build a friendship bracelet. There was coaching. It was, it was pretty extensive. And when you're doing these kinds of things, you're meeting other planners with, versus walking around a show yeah, floor. I think so. it was, yeah, very, very, um, very, yeah, very well done. I think, I think I, IMAX and MPI definitely deserve kudos. Of course, I think we played our part, but um, it's a big event with uh, that many people attending. It's it's kind of a, a pretty large, you know, industry conference in itself, right? And what's really great is some planners don't have the opportunity for education during the actual appointments because they're, they're there to do business, to meet with people. So they get their education on Monday. So it's a brilliant idea. So yeah, we're glad to be a part of that. I think it was it was a successful, successful part of the show. But also on the show floor, there is the the far left area, the inspiration hub, which is filled with education. I also did a couple of sessions on there, but let's not focus on what we did necessarily. But um, the actual space itself is quite impressive. I think there are probably ten or more different spaces for education, ranging from theater style, you know education theaters on the show floor, um, two very intimate sort of table discussions. And there was a Google XI space that, that was very interesting as well. That was very well decorated. And that held things, all sorts of things, right? They had meditation sessions. They had, uh, you know, well-being activities. They had some dancing first thing in the morning on Thursday, which I think half of the people were very excited about and half the people wanted to hide away because it was it was quite crazy. I mean, what what did you see, Barbara? I mean, you, you, I'm sure you spent a little bit of time in that space. What, what what was your impression? I did. I loved the mix of of settings, and um, being on the show floor, it's so convenient to pop over and and check out a session that you think you might be interested in. And you know, if you're not, you just go right back onto the show floor. The uh, we did some things at the long. There was a long, um, almost like farmers' table where you could have uh, coaching and different kinds of smaller conversations. They had the um, some of the, the small theaters had the, the headsets, so the show floor noise was not um, too intrusive. I had no problem hearing. I was at the Google um, space and and. Um, you know, it was very easy to to get involved in the conversation. I think what's really important here is that these are interactive. Everything there is interactive. So you need the right audience for those sessions to work. And nothing is really planned in advance. So it's a little bit of a risk from the organizers, but the ones I went to were very lively and people were engaged. And so there's been a lot of talk in the industry about wellness. And what I loved about this year's IMAX was there were so many wellness activations that were so well attended. I um, took part in a meditation, a 20 minute meditation with Seppi and it was standing room only. That's how many people were there to attend her session. So that was really awesome to see that it's not wellness washing, it's actual activations that people are taking advantage of. 
Yeah, super interesting. I mean, yeah, there, there was definitely some stuff on the Inspiration Hub as well, but also places away from the show floor. I think there was a, a kind of a, a quiet room. I don't, I don't know the names exactly, but there was definitely different spaces around the event, which were not necessarily the easiest to find. But I think that's also intentional, right? If you want to have a quiet space, you want to make it sure it's, that that it's not so easy to kind of jump in and out. But Barbara, I think you made an interesting point, which is, you know, this show floor education. A lot of it feels like you know it's very open right so the idea i think is for people to be able to just jump in and out or just you know poke their heads in and see what's happening and stuff like that which i think brings up an interesting challenge because yes like you mentioned you never know who's going to be there so it's tough to really plan very carefully for for the actual sessions but also as we try to make our sessions more interactive and i definitely did a session that was very discussion based at the event it's hard to do if the audience is expecting to just, you know, step in, see what's going on. If they like it, they'll stay. If they don't, they'll run off somewhere else. And so, you know, like that commitment level is is tricky. And I think once you sort of commit to something, I think you'll stick around, but you're not sure if people will commit. So I don't think it's something we can solve easily, but I think it's worth understanding and, and kind of, I guess, taking in the, uh, the the benefits and the drawbacks of this kind of setting and how it is sort of a quick hit of education, if you will, while you're on the show floor, because it's very intentionally designed to be on the show floor to keep everybody on the show floor. So it does have its challenges attached to it. I mean, I attended another session and after the session was over, everyone was congregated in the back chatting. And then the next session was starting and I saw it was very disruptive for that presenter. So it's really great to have such open space and have it a place where you could drop in and out. But uh, I mean, Miguel, why don't you tell us as a speaker, is it challenging? Yeah, I mean, my experience as a speaker, you don't feel it as much, at least the ones I experienced. But you could definitely hear, you know, some speakers next door were shouting and jumping and getting people to dance and all that kind of thing. And that can be very disruptive for the other sessions. So it's, yeah, you know, it's that tough challenge because you, you we talk about kind of ballrooms being these kind of boring places that are very kind of cookie cutter. But they have their advantages, right? They're, they're kind of controlled environments. So when you're preparing education, they're very nice. When you're, I mean, you're not outdoors here, but you're in the middle of a big space. It has other challenges, right? It's, it's inspiring, but people can get distracted. There's noise. So I don't think there's an ideal solution, particularly of a show this size. But I think it's worth discussing and figuring out, um, you know, how to make it better. And you mentioned the headphones. It, the headphones, I think, are a very interesting solution. I think they, they help with a lot of things. But... What happens at IMAX is there's a headphone system set up, but there's also speakers. You know, you can also just attend the session just hearing the speakers. And so it's almost like if you were just using the headphones, then you could really mitigate that sort of noise pollution. But because you also have speakers, loudspeakers, you know, amplifying the sound, it does make it tricky. So from from an acoustics perspective, it it is a tough setup. I attended an event once and it was in a large ballroom. And each corner had its own speaker and you had your headsets and you had channels and the room was silent and you could move from one to the other. It was a really just cool, different way to present four speakers at once in the same space. And I thought, I th- I think when we're talking about the younger generation and, you know, kind of wowing them or, you know, getting them interested, that, that kind of setup um, might be really useful rather than your typical one person per room, you know. Are you tired of sifting through endless resumes looking for the perfect candidate to fill a leadership opening? Skift Executive Search can help. We have an insider view of the travel industry and can leverage both our expertise and connections to find your next rock star hire. To learn more, visit skift.com slash exec dash search or email us at execsearch at skiff.com. There's a lot, there's a lot to, expect, to, to unpack there. I think for the speakers itself, it might be quite tricky, right? Because you have essentially somebody standing almost next to you doing a completely different session. And then you don't know if the people that's, that are right in front of you are listening to you or if they're listening to one of your neighbor speakers, right? There's a lot of getting used to that, that I think could be quite tricky, but yeah, definitely a a format worth exploring and probably saving some money. Right. Right. And and, I mean, it's, it's proven that the younger generation does, you know, they're doing multiple things at one time. So to me, it's a format that kind of makes sense for that, 
for yeah. that. Um, but do you want to encourage that or do you want to get them to focus? That's true. But really creative. And yeah. you know, one thing about IMAX and, and, and every industry show really um, in our industry is that um, we take risks, we try new formats, we try to just always inject something new and creative. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But that's these are the places to go to, tr to try these things out. Just wanted to uh, mention a couple of things that I think are interesting. Um, two different types of AI powered technology were employed at the Inspiration Hub. We had Wordly captioning, so you could see the captions in English or in different languages um, of the events that were going on, of the sessions that were going on on the, on the larger stages. And you also had SnapSight. So these sessions were recorded and transcribed into AI. And then you could scan a QR code and get kind of takeaways from each session. Um, I think both of those were used. I'd love to get some data from IMAX in terms of how much they were used, but it's interesting to see those two services being, I think they were also used in Frankfurt at IMAX in Frankfurt, the other IMAX show. So almost becoming kind of standard as part of the, the package of, of education sessions at IMAX. And there was a third kind of service, I don't know exactly what to call it, which um, was also happening at IMAX America on at least the stage that I was on doing, doing one of my sessions, which was event wrap, which is a very creative, definitely not technology focused um, service, I guess, uh, where um, a very talented rapper listens to the content of the session and then creates a rap based on a sort of predetermined beat uh, about the session. And I'm a bit torn in terms of how useful it is in terms of, you know, the actual rap that they perform afterwards, but it was very, it was, it was accurate. It was very impressive that they were able to take the meaning from the session and then create a song from it. Uh, and it got a lot of people taking out their phones and taking videos of the performance. So the performance was done right after the session. They kind of took a few minutes to go on stage and do this event rap. Um, I don't know if any of you witnessed that, but um, definitely I did. a lot of phones and came out for that, let's say. I thought it was fun and brilliant because it encouraged people to stay until the very end mm -hmm. because they wanted to see the summary wrap. Yeah. So the wrap up. You, right. The wrap up. So you didn't leave early because you knew that is how the session was going to going to end. Very interesting. Very it's you know, it's always interesting to 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 be at these shows and see, you know, witness different things and, and get different ideas for events. So really interesting to see that. So let's talk a little bit about booths you know i mean the big part of imax is buyers are walking the show floor exhibitors sponsors are at their booths and booth design is important right so that you can attract people you can make people feel welcome you can get people to have comfortable meetings etc but i guess the first point of all this is, is attracting people to the booths right um so what which one stood out for me you know there were probably hundreds, 400 booths, something like that. I think probably a hundred large booths. Which one stood out for you? And I'll start with Andrea. There was a really cute activation in which you went to your phone and you found a photo you liked and you sent it to the people at the booth and then they created a cookie with that photo on the cookie. And the line to get cookies was really, really long. I, I thought that was interesting. And another, you know, personalization is so important now. There was another booth that had all different patches and you picked one that resonated with you and they put it on a baseball cap right on the spot. So there was a lot of interaction, a lot of personalization. Yeah. Interesting. And yeah, I mean, you're, you're kind of going straight, straight to the activations. I think it's super fascinating that idea of how you're going to attract somebody to, to a booth. Um, I also spotted, I think Freeman had uh, engraving on, uh, they, were, they were giving away some, I think, Stanley Cups or kind of wow. custom mugs, and they had engraving so you could engrave your name. So definitely I'm with you in terms of this idea of personalization at, at, at different levels. The cookies, the headshots, I think you mentioned as well, Barbara, as well, there was a Smart Monday headshot station, but there was also one at IMAX. And I, I think throughout the whole show, show, throughout the whole um, show, I saw a line of at least 10 people to get a headshot. And the booth was really out of the way. It was in the kind of far left or far right of the show. Um, any ones to add, Barbara, in terms of what you saw? Yeah, one thing I noticed um, along a different line 
is that um, Hyatt decided to combine all of its brands. And um, so the inclusive was included with the world of Hyatt. It was branded with the new branding. And it was pretty powerful statement for that brand when you put everything together in one place. So I did it. They they were giving out little bites, right? Vegan bites from their from their wellness menu. They did. They had a chef and he was you know, he was cooking on the spot. Yeah, that was fun. Another um, activation I thought that was amazing was Hard Rock Always has a music theme. They had this brand new device that you tell the person working the booth what your favorite song is, and they take flavor tones that go along with the lyrics and create either an alcoholic or non-alcoholic drink for you. So I thought that was brilliant because it stayed with the theme of music and it created your own personalized cocktail or mocktail. I think you bring up a point. uh, And I always looked at advertising this way. I like TV advertising when I used to actually watch TV and not stream. But um, that whatever you do, it needs to be memorable and connected to the brand or it's really not successful. So it's interesting um, that, you know, you, you are connecting these experiences to the brand, but um, really important, kind of important takeaway. And, and if not, it's, it's not really aligned, you know, not really successful. And I went with a colleague and we had two completely different song choices. So the drinks were completely different. So (laughs) I just thought it was brilliant. Nicely done. So I also wanted to mention a few of the, I guess the, the, the boots that, that showed off or that kind of showed up in, in different ways. Um, I thought that the uh, Korea and the Hong Kong boots were you know, really loud, really flashy, lots of neon lights. But I think it's sort of part of the brand, right? They kind of felt like right for the destination. Um, and so they were, they were very interesting. I think Korea had a lot of presentations. There, there was a lot of loud kind of conversations going on. And a brilliant way to um, retrieve leads because there was so much energy. So I went on like Thursday is my favorite day at the show. I've told you both that the last day it's quiet. You could have more in depth conversations, but I went over to the Korea booth and you had to ask, you had to answer a series of questions about how much you know about Korea. And then you were able to, um, go into a box and pick out a ball. And in the ball was a little tag that said what your prize was. And I won beautiful stickers from Seoul, but just really interesting way to get leads. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very uh, well thought out and on brand. I I personally also enjoyed the Baltimore booth, um, which was kind of like a little three building facade of a kind of a typical Baltimore downtown uh, house. It looked like it was quite easy to set up, like something that could be transported and, and kind of set up at a, at a trade show rel- relatively easy. It was a small-ish booth, but, you know, I think it's important to make those attractive. And I also enjoyed the Napa Valley booth, which had this kind of, you know, as the brand, you know, very obviously to the brand had a kind of winery feel to it, where you could stand at these or sit at these kind of high tables as if you were in a winery and it had kind of wine themed around it. I thought that was very inviting and I think on brand, uh, which I think is important. What was a little sad was, you know, Florida always has a huge area and Tampa had a really impressive booth, but there was hardly any people there because the week of IMAX is when the hurricane hit and it was headed straight for Tampa. So a lot of people left early or didn't come at all. Yeah, very sad. Of course, we've we've written about that already. Um, So a lot of people impacted by that. So um, sad. Oh, there was definitely everyone at the show was concerned and um, it, people were, you know, doing hurricane prep right on the show floor. So it's and just awful and our hearts go out to those, to those industry. Absolutely. Friends. And then we talked about how a lot of organizations release information during IMAX destinations international was releasing a case study about its last conference that was held in Tampa. And, you know, the head of the Tampa CVB was going to be there part of the press conference, but he stayed back in Tampa. So I want to make sure we mention a couple more uh, activations. Um, I also, we Encore had a, quite a, a large activation and they uh, kind of did a, it was a, it was an interactive activation. So you went through and kind of experienced some of the uh, things that Encore does. And as before, um, I think in previous years, they've done different themes. I think this year was a bit more, 
directly linked to the services that they provide. And they kind of picked up on this theme of pricing and value, uh, which is what we talked about with um, with their CEO, Ben Irwin, at the Skift Meetings Forum quite recently. And so I, I, I give my kudos to Uncor for tackling um, that topic, because I think it's a tough topic, because obviously it's it's something that challenges their business. But I think the fact that they're actually tackling it is, is quite interesting in itself. And they had a big, big activation, a lot of area for discussion uh, there. They also had education at the Encore booth. And I noticed that with a few other booths. So uh, at least Maritz and also the Smart Source booth had a dedicated space. And a lot of booths have spaces for presentations, but these booths actually had education sessions. So they were listed in the education listing of IMAX, not just a, you know, a sales pitch for or a presentation about the product, let's say. Um, so I think that that was quite interesting and um, definitely something I think would be good to see more of. Um, but it does make it quite confusing because you might think you're going to an education session on the Inspiration Hub, but actually it's somewhere else. It's on the other side of the show floor. And when that happens, you're probably going to be about 10 minutes late if, if it's on the other side of the show floor. <laughs> any other stands that you'd like to point out or any um, any kind of activations that you thought really stood out for you? Um, there was a sock stand that was showing how they personalize socks and they were giving planners IMEX socks. That was really a popular stand as well. Well, nicely complementing the sneakers, right? Like we covered, there was a, definitely a lot of sneakers going on. IMEX had their own sneakers. Uncor had their own. I mean, you tell me what, what other brands had, had a whole sneaker game going on. Caesars had personalized um, Orlando and um, it was fun because a few of the attendees started a sneaker challenge. And um, after Ken Halsinger from Freeman session, he's a big sneaker collector. Um, people who wanted to be part of the challenge showed up and um, someone from IMAX was a judge. And um, this man, he hasn't been to a show since before COVID and he was the winner. And he said, what a highlight that was for him. And he was given this teeny tiny little trophy. It was just all in fun. But he yeah. had on a pair of Gary V sneakers and he won the contest. Yeah, some sort of very custom edition Gary V sneakers. So uh, impressive. It sounds, I don't know, I'm not a sneakerhead, but I don't know if I would wear custom edition shoes to IMAX. It feels like, a, you know, you're going to wear them down pretty quickly, but hey. But what is wonderful to see is that women aren't expected to wear dress shoes anymore. Because that show is tough on your feet while you're wearing sneakers. So then to add dress shoes to the mix is tough. So that yeah. was really refreshing. Yeah, heels. I mean, it was all about, you know, heels are not are not comfortable for a lot of women. Uh, if you are a sneaker aficionado, we have a gallery of our favorite IMEX sneakers on our website. So take a look. Yeah, and there's some really fun ones there. So you're probably sick and tired of us talking about IMAX. So I want to wrap up and uh, and 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 conclude with you know congratulations to the IMAX team. I think we had a I think everybody there had a successful show. I think all the feedback we heard was was incredibly positive. Uh, I overheard some rumors that uh, some um, attendees were saying that IMAX was going to move. It wasn't going to be in Vegas. It was going to change location. Uh, but uh, Andrea Doyle was at the closing press conference and asked the tough question of the IMAX team, what's next for IMAX America? And what did you hear, Andrea? That IMAX will stay in Las Vegas and they have their dates set up through 2027. Yeah. And I think you heard from Karina Bauer, the CEO, that they're indefinitely staying in Vegas, right? So I mean, imagine right. they have no plans to move away. And during the press conference, the Las Vegas um, CVB person looked at me and said, IMAX isn't going anywhere. All right. Well, there you go. You can expect it to be around in October every year um, in Las Vegas. So uh, if you haven't been before, we do encourage you to, to try to make it. I think you'll have a very uh, interesting experience. So that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much for listening. Barbara, Andrea, thank you for joining me today. Thank you both. See you soon. Hey there, if you're listening to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts, please make sure to subscribe, rate us five stars, or leave us a positive review. That really helps us get out the word about the Skiff Meetings podcast and make sure that we can continue to bring you this podcast every week, absolutely free of charge. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to the Skiff channel and hit the notification bell to find out whenever a new video drops.
Want to reach the most influential audience in travel? Skip Decks helps brands solve problems, create unforgettable moments, and communicate big ideas through content, research, and event activations. Learn more about how we can help you at skiftx.com.